Today we would be interviewing an honorable guest we have with us on our show. We, he is one of the most talented people we know in the field of mechanical engineering and he is a postdoctorate in this field. Today we welcome Dr. Saeed Al Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just start by saying that can you give us a brief detail about your professional life? Um, well, about my professional life, I, I've been actually very lucky in that uh, I have uh, uh, completed all my formal education, uh, including my PhD and postdoc in one go very quickly when I actually uh, had that chance of doing that. Um, so if I just actually recount uh, my uh, time from starting from my time here in college of BME from where I graduated as a mechanical engineer back in uh, 2002. And uh, soon after that, I started with my MS. And I started with my MS from the same very same institute. And then uh, because of my performance in my MS and my previous career, I was selected for uh, being sent abroad on the faculty development program uh, of NERSC. And in that, I went to UMIS, which is University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, uh, for MSc. And there, after my MSc, I had a distinction in MSc, and on the basis of that, I then had a scholarship for a PhD over there. And uh, uh, then I started my PhD in the field of composites. So I started my bachelor's, I mean, I did in the field of mechanical engineering, and then I went on to study manufacturing and systems management in masters and then in PhD I uh, did work on composites and uh, since then I have been working on composites so after completing my, my PhD from there I had a one year postdoctoral experience there as well and uh, after that uh, since 2009 I'm here with NUST seven years as an assistant professor so it, it completes the whole circle, you see. <laughs> Back to the place from where I started. And I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, glad that I can actually contribute to the uh, institution from where uh, I started with them. Right. Thank you. Uh, tell us about your accomplishments. Well, uh, in terms of my accomplishments, uh, uh, I have been uh, uh, receiving uh, scholarships for throughout my career. So starting from my undergraduate career, I, I received NUS scholarships, mm -hmm. and then, uh, as I just remarked, that for a postdoctorate and for my PhD and for former masters, uh, all were various scholarships. So partially it was NUS scholarship, partially it was uh, it was called as the EPS scholarship, Engineering and Physical Sciences Scholarship of the University of Manchester, which I received for my further qualification. So that's one thing. Um, in terms of uh, other uh, accomplishments, uh, I have a number of uh, publications, research articles uh, in journals as well as various conferences to my credit. Uh, I'm also author, uh, editor of a book and uh, currently I'm actually also authoring another book. And um, I mean, that's really all about the educational side. I have not really been uh, much of a sports fan <laughs> since my I mean, school days. That was the time when I really uh, enjoyed doing sports and participating in debates uh, and things like that. So at that time, of course, I, I, I was a part of the champion team for the football as well at one time right. and uh, also represented my college in all Pakistan level declamation contest. I was uh, number third in the intercity debating competitions as well in Islamabad. So, but this, this is not about that. Okay, thank you. So, how was your childhood and you were growing up? Um, I mean, childhood. <laughs> now, I would actually probably mention my schooling in ICP because I take a lot of pride that I am an ICP. Mm -hmm. And uh, because from prep until uh, FSC, I stayed in ICP. Uh, and that's where most of my uh, childhood was actually spent. And, and ICP is a very dynamic kind of college. Um, I mean, it gives you everything really because we had excellent sporting facilities, we had very active literary club, hiking club, debating society. Uh, so I, I grew in that atmosphere. Uh, and, and I think the best part of studying in ICP is that you get people from all segments of life. 
So it's not you know all rich rich or all poor poor. Right. It's actually a very good mix. So get getting that initial training in ICD actually trains you how you deal with each segment, and that is very very important that we don't learn that. Because unfortunately, what I'm witnessing now in our society that is increasing, you know, uh, as the day is progressing, that we have schools which are actually segmenting the society. So we have the school for the rich and we have the school for the poor, and they don't have any interaction with each other from the very start. So that means, you know, you don't really get to see a lot of what you actually need to see to be able to deliver and contribute to the country. So both your school and college education was from ICB. Yes. I was uh, always an ICB before my engineering career. Okay. <laughs> so you know, I, I stayed there. Could you tell us something good, interesting about your college life? Oh, I mean, recounting my college life. You, you're talking about the uh, college life as in uh, the life in ICB yes. uh, rather than in the, the, in the mechanical engineering. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there are so many interesting things. Um, yeah. And uh, do you want me to recount any particular one of them? Um, Anyone that like you thought the most interesting moment at that time? Well, um, as I said, I mean it's 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 it's, it's a long time now, and but there are there are, there are many things that you know you do when, when you're there. One of the events which I never forget was one of the debate competitions that I participated in while doing my ICD, and I actually went to your college, Dahlia College, it was called. And I'm not talking the Dahlia University, yes. I'm talking about the Dahlia College. And I, that was a, a debate that I had to participate. I was just told a few days ago that you know I have to come for that debate in your university. And uh, this was there was this senior of ours who actually helped me in that debate because of the field. I, I was in, in I think tenth uh, grade at that time, um, and uh, so I went into this declamation contest in Dahlia. And the response of the crowd that I actually got, I cannot forget. I mean, at the, because there was this punchline in that particular speech, and that was, where is UNO? And on that particular punchline, the whole uh, crowd and the whole hall will actually uh, shout yeah. with me, yes. And then they will say, yes, where is UNO? And then, that was an amazing experience. Uh, I mean, I have, as I said, participated in all Pakistan level as well and many other places. But I still remember that particular uh, incident very well. Yeah. Okay, why did you choose this field of study, mechanical engineering? Were you forced or was it by own choice? Uh, not really. I mean, I was not. I was never forced. My, my parents are not like that. They actually gave me a very open hand. Even when I had to choose uh, after my matriculation, that should I continue the training there in Opie I actually spent quite a good time. Uh, first of all, studying pre-medical <laughs> because yeah. I was not able to make up my mind. So right. I started in the start in the summer breaks. You know, right. I, I started studying both pre-engineering and uh, bio and uh, mathematics. But ultimately, I, I, I thought that no, I'm not really a biology person. I, I need to go into engineering. That's where my heart lies, and that's why I actually came into engineering. And um, and in terms of engineering, then of course, NUSP was at that time. Uh, in I think still, I believe it is uh, one of the top ranking institutes of the country. So uh, I ultimately ended up in mechanical engineering. Was your university life same as ours, or was it different? Um. Well, I, I think things move on and they change. So I can't say it was exactly like yours. Um, in our in in our time, especially at NASP, because you know we were. Uh, um, one of the starting batches when the civilian students uh, were actually coming in larger number in, in NASP because previously it was mostly a military institute uh, or military college. So that transition from military to civil had not really taken place. So uh, while being in a uh, in civil, uh, by, while still being civilian students, we were forced to a number of restrictions that were there. Uh, Courtesy of the you know the, the, the fact that it is a military college, so it was a bit different in that sense. Um, uh, as far as the things like courses and the syllabi is concerned, of course there are uh, certain changes, uh, 
But by and large, uh, I think it's not uh, been very different, especially because I, I'm, I'm not a very old graduate anyway. I'm, I'm one of the, I just graduated in 2002. So, uh, but probably now we are finding more and more use of computers and uh, the softwares in, in the study. So that's one of the bigger differences. Uh, and I think one more thing is that people are now paying more attention to the communication skills. So that's why you're here with me today. <laughs> okay. What are your uh, What are your views on the education system of Pakistan? Um, I mean, I think just like I said for my previous question, I think the, the biggest problem or the biggest challenge that we are facing right now in our education is actually the segmentation of the society. Education is supposed to bring people together, not separate them into compartments of have and have nots. So that is our fundamental challenge. Uh, and that actually goes deep down. Previously, this divide was between the rural and the urban areas only. But now, even within the urban areas, you can see a very, very significant divide. So it was expected that with growing urbanization, this divide would actually reduce. But this didn't happen. Because now you have schools with varying fee, fee structures, and they are, uh, you know, uh, not really, I think, beneficial in the, to, for the country in, in that sense. Um, and other thing that we really, really need to work uh, on our education uh, is that we we cannot, uh, you know, have the choice that should we invest in higher education or just the primary education. I think we need to invest in both. There is, there shouldn't be any doubt in our minds because for us, both the sectors are equally important, and we cannot neglect any one of them. Right. And why did you choose this teaching profession? Like, was it by your love of for teachers? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if I tell you that, perhaps you won't believe me. But uh, uh, you know, uh, I was a. Uh, eighth grader when one of my teachers asked me that what do you want to become and I told him that I want to become a researcher okay. and an academic. So uh, yes, it was actually for the love of this okay. profession. Uh, okay. I'm very, I, I, I take pride in this thing that you know I'm prob probably one of the few people who come in this profession by choice. Okay. So I, I, I always enjoy doing research uh, and also enjoy teaching. Okay. So I mean, that's, that's in my genes. What are your hobbies? Oh, not much now, as I said. <laughs> Mostly it's related with studying. Uh, so of course I like and I love reading books. Um, I also love swimming, although I don't really get a lot of time for that. Uh, I used to play squash as well, but uh, that for that as well, I'm hardly finding any time now. So really, if you ask me my hobby these days, mm -hmm. uh, it's just reading a good book, just to kind of relax myself. There are some of the undergraduate and master students in our university are married. Were you married at the time of your higher studies? Um, I actually got married uh, while I was doing PhD. So I was not married in the start. Okay. So, but uh, then after I had done my master's and I was studying for my PhD, I was in the first year of my PhD when I got married. I got engaged just uh, at the start of my master's, mm -hmm. uh, but then I got married in, in, uh, in during my PhD. Now, of course, that uh, creates, uh, some people think that that creates a lot of problem, yeah. problems, but uh, it's, it's really how you actually balance your life. Okay. So uh, with marriage, of course, you have additional responsibility of a family with you. Right. Um, but uh, um, So were there like problems uh, as being as a husband at the same time and a student at the same time? I, I wouldn't call them problems because, you know, you are always in your life. You will be a husband at the same time, and then an, an employee, probably, right? So uh, it's it's how you manage it that matters. Of course, it adds to your responsibilities, but then probably spending a um, you know a whole weekend watching movies with my friend, I would be probably spending the same time with my family then, and you know uh, probably working in the afternoons or something like that to to support them. But that's that's a part of the deal. So you, you lose something, you get something, and ultimately it's, I think there is no right or wrong answer in this. You as an individual uh, need to make the decision what is important for you in your life. So if your friends are more important and you want to give yourself more time, don't get married. 
family right? life. But if, if family life is more important for you, then probably you shouldn't get married, I understand. Yeah. Okay, we have heard that most of the students complain of favorism in, in grading. So did you face anything like that as a student? I, I don't quite agree. I don't quite agree. I, I, think, I think, I mean, you know, uh, let's be fair and honest. Uh, there will be some uh, instructors probably who will not be very uh, loyal to their profession, but I think they, their numbers are, um, are very, very less. At least in my personal life, uh, especially in my professional career, uh, in, in both undergraduate and then higher studies, I, 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 I don't find many people who would be, you know, uh, involved in in unethical behavior, as I, I should call it, in terms of favoritism. Um, but yes, I can't completely deny that. During my MSc, I had a problem with one of uh, very senior professors uh, in in University of Manchester, actually. Uh, but that was not really uh, a case of actually favorism. Sometimes you, you can't really get along very well with your supervisor, and he's expecting a different set of things, and you are expecting a different set of things. And so I wouldn't really say that you know he he's being unjustified, but it's it's just like any two people, you know. You if there is a different set of expectations, uh, and he's looking for a, a different set of things from you as an outcome. But you're not really giving it to him. Then you may say, you know, he's being, he's not being just to you. Yeah. But uh, uh, it's it's really, uh, I would say, a matter of point of view, how how you would view it. So I'm not saying that there there is totally no favoritism, because we are all human beings. So there is an element of that. But most of the people who choose this profession, um, because it's, it is a sacred profession, so I think they they abstain from it as much as possible.